All right, yeah, we should we should get started. Um, good morning, afternoon, evening, everybody. Thanks for tuning in. Uh, I'm John Twabish from the Urban Institute. Uh, very excited to have Nadi Bremer on with us today. Hi, Nadi. Hi. And just so um, so we can make sure we get this on the record, because I got your name in, uh, in when we first when the first time we met in person, I incorrectly pronounced your name. So in case people are wondering why is he mispronouncing her name, I'm not. It's actually pronounced Nadi. It's not Nadia, which is the mistake that I made. So now we all have that. So I yes. often feel better when I know that and I'm like looking at people's work and I'm like, I know how to pronounce the name. So now this is one of the things that we all <laughs> have a shared understanding. So, um, so uh, yeah, so, okay. So here's a quick setup for today. Um, Nadia's gonna talk about this new project that she did on the Hubble telescope. Um, very exciting. Uh, I'm just gonna let her talk about it, show it to you. Um, and then uh, I'll just open it up for questions. So if you have questions about this project or other projects or whatever, um, just drop them in the chat box. I'll build up a little queue and then you can unmute yourselves and you can all talk. I'm just your moderator, really. Um, so um, Nadia, I'll just hand it over to you. Maybe before you get into the project, um, just maybe, you know, talk a little bit about your background and how you got, because this like, like everybody in this field, you did not come to DataViz through DataViz. You came at it from, you came at it from the stars, really. Yes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so um, yeah, go ahead, take it away and just drop questions in the chat box, folks. Okay, thanks. Sure. Uh, yeah, so my name is Nadi and uh, uh, it's because in the Netherlands, if you have an I and E, it's pronounced as a hard E, uh, but I guess in American, it's different. Uh, but anyway, uh, I used to be an astronomer. I graduated as an astronomer, uh, after which I knew I didn't want to do a PhD because uh, I, I love doing research. I think astronomy is still very, very fascinating, but um, I hate writing papers. So that was that was basically it. Uh, and I became a data scientist working for Deloitte Consulting. Uh, and a lot of fun there. But after a few years, I figured actually that I love data visualization even more than the data analysis. Uh, so then I, I, I threw in basically every evening hour and weekend that I had to uh, teach myself more about data visualization. So I was already learning D3 a little bit, but then I was trying to do it like daily. I, I read books by all the, the great names. Uh, I made tons of projects. I think that's uh, in, in the end, the best way to learn to actually make visualizations and learn from your mistakes and get better at whatever tool you've uh, chosen to be, um, to do your visualizations with. Uh, and after about a year, um, after I sort of figured out that I wanted to do DataViz, I started working for Agen. It's a Dutch company as a DataViz designer. But um, then I learned that even though uh, I like D3. I didn't really enjoy building dashboards anymore. Uh, this wasn't my thing. I guess I wanted to have something more creative. I started data sketches with Shirley Wu, which was a personal collaboration where in 12 months we, well, <laughs> we made 12 projects, maybe not in 12 months, um, but we tried. Uh, and then I discovered like, this is where my passion lies in terms of data visualization. This is a little bit more creative and custom side. Uh, and then three years ago, a little bit over three years ago now, I started as a freelancer under Visual Cinnamon and uh, still very happy that I did that. Uh, and the project that I wanna talk to you about is uh, the Hubble project. I should probably start sharing my screen at this point, right? Uh, let's see, share screen. I have a very big screen, so I wonder if if is is this too like is this <laughs> making everything too small <laughs> or is it okay uh, let's see well it'll depend how much how much detail you're going to show us so it's it's pretty zoomed out <laughs> but I yeah. Know. <laughs> uh, yeah because um, i always work from home as a freelancer i have like a 38 inch screen so it's basically two screens <laughs> side by side so 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 is this is are you buying 38 inch screens for everybody on the call is that are you like going to be like Oprah <laughs> right now because that would be awesome <laughs> i'm sorry no no i'm very sorry um my budget. can you um can you change the uh resolution on the screen can i <laughs> Sorry about this. No, that's uh, fine. Display. Like I've said, this is the most casual discussion series ever. <laughs> like what would be good? Um, you could also, well, you could also maybe just when you share, yeah, go to um, 
share, when you click the share button, you'll be able to share different windows. So maybe you can just share that specific window instead of the right. whole desktop. Okay, that, that means I'll that probably have to uh, jump around a little bit between okay. stuff though. Okay. Um, there we go. Right. There we yep. go. So this is uh, so this is the project that uh, like the final result of the project. So um, in I think August of last year, Physics Today reached out to me and say like we think we have something for you that you will like. Uh, I guess they <laughs> because they thankfully knew that I was an astronomer and it was uh, to celebrate Hubble's three year. Uh, anniversary of being up there in space and then uh, making observations about our um, our galaxy and universe they wanted to sort of make a visualization about all of these these observations so you can actually the there is a public a data set uh, well there's a public um, database that has all of these uh, observations uh, and not just for hubble for other uh, space telescopes as well it's called the uh, mikulski archive for space telescopes and thankfully there are apis there's a, a Python API, for example, and you can just download like everything or just a very specific part. Uh, and I just uh, downloaded everything from Hubble. Uh, that's, and then um, wanted to sort of, we wanted to visualize that. We didn't know at the start where, what we wanted to visualize. So I also had to go into a very long process of uh, uh, sort of data analysis and preparation. Let me see, I need to share a new window. Uh, are right um so i made a script <laughs> and it's uh, this is a was a slow process of making this so we have the um the hubble data this is basically the raw data that you got so every every row is like a, um, an observation and we have some information about where it's located um how long the observation was uh, taking uh, the wavelength region the exact one a target classifications, which was one of the more important, uh, like the more interesting stuff, like what has been observed? Was it a star? Was it a galaxy? And then even more specific, like was it the planetary nebula? Um, some things about the proposals. So for some, for example, it was very uh, useful to, um, if you have the proposal idea, I could then find sort of these famous photos that um, maybe some of you might know from Hubble, uh, and I can find those photos and then they would have a proposal ID and I can I can sort of look them up here again and see which actual uh, sort of observations went into creating that uh, that photograph. So that was pretty cool. Uh, but I had to do a lot of elevation levels of Iceland. Um, I had to do a lot of stuff to uh, to clean this data set. Like there were a few that didn't have a name. So I looked up the names. Um, there were some that had the time switched around. Very few though, like observation start and end time. and and this just kind of this this analysis kind of grew and grew uh, looking into the instruments, uh, looking into the wavelength regions. Um, I mean, and and finally also looking into these um, these classifications. Here we see like the top 50 uh, of the most used target classifications. If it ever updates anyway, it's uh, so there's a lot going on with different kinds of classifications, but uh, <laughs> I won't, there is actually not that much interesting going on here because they all sort of follow the um, sort of the double bump that is that is the um, observation sort of Hubble has a lot of observations ramping up until about 2004 and then it sort of settles down into sort of a steady pace. But we do have extrasolar planets, planets coming up as a new thing, which are planets around other systems than in our own solar system. But anyway, I, I, lots of data cleaning, data preparation done here. And then finally, at the end, we had an idea of like, what do we actually want to visualize? Uh, the first thing was basically just a map of showing you where all of these observations were happening. Uh, because that it, the idea that you could actually say like, oh, I know this photo of Hubble, or I know about this important um, like scientific discovery that Hubble has made, but now we can actually say, well, that was actually taken uh, somewhere over there in the sky, right besides this constellation that you may know. Uh, see. And let me just take you through, that's not gonna open up all of my, let's see this is smart, my um, screen caps, screen grab, screenshots. I, I take a lot of screenshots uh, during the uh, creation of this. Okay. Yes, I am sure I wanna open 260 items. Great, now I can share that.
so the most important visualization to create was this sort of sky map and then there were there were some other ideas that we wanted to investigate but eventually the sky map was so became so big that i only made one extra uh, other visualization but i already have done a, um, a sort of a, a, a map of the sky before for a, one of the data sketches projects called figures in the sky so i basically took that code and I uh, pretty quickly I had something with uh, that looked like a sky with the stars, the actual stars in there. Um, and then uh, going into sort of trying some uh, different sort of rotations to make it look like the way it seemed online, uh, plotting all of these observations in there. Oh yeah, this this is one of my favorite bloopers. I call it the eye of Sauron. I don't it's it's rotated wrong with the uh, <laughs> with the, uh, the the Milky Way in the background. Where is that one? I'm missing one thing. Okay, so here I actually had um, I had my Hubble observations wrong. Um, this is so this is sl slowly just trying to get all of these observations in right, putting in the constellations and background, and then plotting all of these Hubble observations. But this is 500,000 observations. So even though it doesn't quite look like that, it's because lots of places have many overlap going on. So this was going to be a tricky thing to actually sort of make visually apparent where the stuff was really happening, where the most interesting stuff was happening. Um, see what's going on. <laughs> so here is already trying different color plots. Um, maybe I should do it more like this. Right. Um, so different color plots, so because we have different kinds of these targets, we have the stars, we have the galaxies, and we have a few more such as interstellar matter, which is more like nebulous stuff. Um, and we had uh, solar system targets. So this, this green line is actually solar system targets because they typically, uh, everything in the solar system revolves in it's kind of in the plane of the sun uh, that we all sort of revolve in. So it's, it's really a straight line, but because of the projection here, it looks like this sort of uh, curved shape. Uh, and then there are other things in the background, but I really was liking this this particular color palette. Uh, so I tried um, also going through different projections because even though this is the one that the Hubble site itself was using, uh, if you go to the the Mokolsky Archive for Space Telescopes website, they have basically this image um, on their website. So that's what I started with. But I felt like this was not a really good way of looking at it because here we have. I don't know if you can see. Can you see my mouse actually? Yes. No? Yep. Yes. Okay, yes. Right. Yep. Um, so here we have the big bear, but it's really stretched out. And here's actually the, um, uh, the little bear, the little dipper, and it's also quite stretched out. So the North, uh, the North Pole is over here and the South Pole is over here. So it's very um, unfamiliar. I'm trying to map this onto uh, what you know from seeing your own night sky. Uh, so I also tried looking into a different kind of projection, which is this one, which is often used for um, map, like these star maps of our night sky. Um, so that took some time to get working. Uh, no, that's not right. <laughs> uh, then I went into like a phase of font choices. Sorry, that's kind of boring. I just apply all of them and then very slowly start putting, taking out the ones that I like the least and then uh, ending up with one. Uh, okay, so here I had the stereographic working, still with that color palette that I wasn't happy with. Um, let's see, different color palette trying a different blend mode, sometimes that can be very interesting where uh, if you, this, for example, this is a screen, so that, might, that means that the more of these dots that are overlapping, the wider it gets. So now it becomes more clear that these areas over here, um, they're actually very dense in number of observations, whereas uh, other areas over here, for example, they, they, may, they see a lot, but there's actually it's, it's a lot less dense because it's not white yet, uh, whereas this part is white. But it wasn't quite happy yet. It was very difficult to see what was stars and what was Hubble observations. Um, so I did try a bunch of other color combinations and different sizes, making them the Hubble observations really big, but then it was just, you know, one big area of color. Um, so I thought, well, well, what if I try and do a contour plot so I can see actually where certain main targets are um, mostly concentrated. So where are most of the galaxy observations and where are most of the star observations done? Uh, of course, the contour plot took some time to get working. Uh, but I got there eventually. So this this is uh, the working contour plot. So we can definitely see that we had that um, a lot of observations here and over here. But apparently there are other places that have a lot of these sort of very dense observations. 
Uh, this was just solar systems, and now we go into a few of the other options uh, where we're looking only at certain types of main targets. This really helped me sort of get a sense of where should I really be looking for certain colors um, to see if the color palette that I'd chosen was actually a good one. Uh, so this would be stars, here we have the solar system again. Um, let's see, and this is then sort of the same idea, but, but just with white. Going to like again a different color palette. This just keeps happening. I thought, well, maybe if if the stars are sort of uh, distracting me, so I just I just kept the constellation lines, and then I, I eventually took everything out except for this sort of line of the Milky Way. But now it was very hard for me to say like, um, I I mean I I still had the name of the North Pole star over here, but um, that was just because I'd forgotten to. Um, the comment that part of the code, but it was very hard for me to say like, what am I looking at? How how am I how am I supposed to uh, see this based on the sky? So I it was it wasn't really working just having the Hubble observations. I thought at first. Um, let's see. So I made them all white. I made all of the Hubble observations white, and then I made all of the stars uh, yellow. Or here is the, the other way around. But so. Um, so I thought, well, if all the Hubble observations are white and everything else is yellow, then we can clearly see what is Hubble observations and what is stars. I made the stars st stroke circles so that for some of the more, um, like the bigger and more popular stars, we can actually see like Sirius, for example, here has had actual uh, Hubble observations themselves. And because they were stroked, it was easier to see um, that they were actually, um, that there was um, these Hubble observations inside of that. But I still felt that it was hard to see. So I kept on trying different things. This was all of the stars again that was clearly made too much yellow. You completely lost the overview of sort of the, the Hubble observations. Uh, so it's, if this was really a project where it, it wasn't so much a, an issue of like what chart form do I want to use because I knew that I wanted to use a sort of map of the sky. It was basically just do I want this elliptical form or these two circles. But by this point, I'd figured out that the two circles was better. It was really about these very small design decisions that had a major impact on how easy it was or how informative um, you could actually, how much information you could, you could glean from this, uh, from this map. Um, so this was basically just the constellations that were left with 88 Western constellations. Um, let's see what's happening here. And bringing back the contour plots, because I thought, well, if I have all of these white observations, I complete, I cannot, I can no longer show you like where are all the stars, where are all of the galaxies, where are all of the uh, the solar system targets. So I wanted to make these sort of contour plots to add um, next to this main map. And this was sort of me again figuring out how that um, how that looked, how to combine these different things because they had a lot of overlap. Uh, for example, we have interstellar medium over here, um, and we have where's let's see, and we have stars, and they are both sort of in the in the middle around the around the Milky Way. So combining these plots on top of each other would create a lot of overlap. So um, it was um, again some trial and error in trying to figure out how can I make these these different sets of contours um, sort of appear like di as distinct groupings, which came down to like very um, very distinct colors. So I ended up with this blue and yellow and red and green, and then making them very sort of um, vibrant. So just using the, the most like colors that I could make uh, and only having, so having very thick lines and using only very few sort of these contour levels, only about four for each of these grouping. Um, putting back the Milky Way back in, that was really just a stylistic choice. Uh, and then I added them sort of to the map as this sort of mini map as a um, as a way to say like, okay, so all of these white dots are Hubble observations, but here's actually where all of these different targets are located. Um, I started pointing out some of the more sort of the bigger structures in the sky that have that seen a lot of observations. Error. Um, I only kept a few of the constellations. I still felt like there was too much going on. Uh, so only some of them were famous. So this was like step number five in trying to minimize the number of distractions without taking away too many of these waypoints. Uh, and I guess this is basically what I sent to uh, Physics Today. It's my first sort of uh, result. Oh, yeah. I still added these sort of marks around the outside. Again, really just for um, uh, that it 
it, visual flourish. So I looked up lots of historic sky maps, and they often had these um, these double um, these dotted lines around them, and the number like the right ascension, which typically is done in hours, 24 hours, is like one rotation. Um, and then some zodiac signs, and just again for this sort of visual style, just to make it a little more interesting. Right. So this I sent to uh, to physics today, and then I went to sleep. And then I woke up and I was like, wait, why, uh, why am I really, why am I not using color in the Hubble observations? I mean, that's way more interesting than, than these stars. I really need to try and bring back the color. Um, so I did. I used the same color palette that I now had used for the, um, the contour maps. I added, I, I played around a little bit with the other colors that I could use for a, a there's pink as well, which is for um, unidentified. Uh, but then I was like, okay, so, but how do I bring back these, these, these waypoints? Uh, because I didn't want to have any stars anymore because everything was now colored. So there was really no way for me to really easily bring back these stars. So I only picked like the four or five most maybe famous stars, um, like the, the North Pole star and Betelgeuse and Sirius. Uh, just again, as these waypoints. And I thought maybe I could put in the constellation lines themselves, but no, that was actually too distracting. Um, so I guess I left it at that. <laughs> I guess I left it. Oh no, wait. You can see here that I put in the names of some of the more uh, of the more famous um, constellations in the background. And then there was a part where I thought, well, I have like now that I'm starting on this, why not use the corners as well to to add extra information? So I I put I created these sort of zoom maps that uh, would put zoom ins of certain portions in uh, in the in the in the corners. Here I got finally got that working. Uh, so, like slowly putting in the other zoom maps, <laughs> uh, and then I sent this to um, Hubble uh, to uh, Physics Today again, uh, and they were like, "Okay, this is maybe getting a bit too busy. We do like the colors, but everything in the corners is just too much." So I took that out again. <laughs> we didn't use it in the end, though, uh, for like separate, like these separate zoom in maps. Another round of font choices because. Uh, physics today has their own fonts, and I didn't, I didn't use them at the start. Da, 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 da. Oh, and then it was time to make it into a poster. So even though I, I sort of ended up with this, I knew that I, um, I'd i wanted to also, I needed the legend, but I also wanted to incorporate sort of actual, um, these actual proposals, like proposals that led to scientific breakthroughs, proposals that led to beautiful imagery. So it, it was, I knew that I somehow needed to turn this more into a poster than an actual more, uh, I guess, um, just a chart. Uh, so I took, I downloaded this PNG that I got. Um, this was done in Canvas, so the result was already a PNG. So I saved it, opened it up in Affinity Designer, which I, I prefer over um, Adobe Illustrator to use. Uh, so it was really then, okay, so how am I going to put all these things together? Um, how do I add these images? But that was sort of this masonry part style of putting all of these images together was just not working with sort of the very straight and, and perfect geometric style of the map itself. So I, I turned it all into I turned it all into sort of um, a row of images that you can see. In, oh, there it is. Um, in, in that final image, there's my final image. Poster, scan map. So this final image, it's all uh, in a row. And this sort of this, this is how then I, um, I kept sending it back and forth to, um, to Physics Today and they looked up like, we want these proposals on, um, on the highlighted. And then I would incorporate them and look, look up for the relevant information in my R data set. So I knew, for example, um, I would know the proposal ID, the name, uh, and they would then write this sort of short section of why why was this proposal or why was this research done so fascinating or why did it give such an interesting sort of visual result? Um, and yeah, and that was uh, that was sort of the creation process of this this um, this visualization. Although I also, if you if you want to know even more details, I also wrote a blog on my website just um, two days ago that goes into even more stuff. <laughs> but yeah, that's it. That's great. That's great. Um, so there's one question that rolled in and then, and I, I can uh, expand on it maybe. So there was a question about 
Uh, can you share the color palettes you typically start with, start with, or is it very specific to the task? Um, you also had a part there where you were talking about the fonts. You were just sort of playing with fonts. Is that your like general approach to color and font? Is just kind of playing a little bit? Uh, yes. Yeah. So um, let me again share my full screen because now the details don't really matter that much anymore. Um, I do. I have a starting uh, starting fonts. Uh, uh, sorry, starting colors. So I always use. Uh, <laughs> I can't see it. <laughs> The zoom window is in the way. Go away. <laughs> oh no. Okay. Uh, well, maybe it's I lost my little thingy. Here yeah. it is again. It's an oh damn it. So there we go. We saw it really quickly. I have this palette that I call dark rainbow. Uh, it's typically the I always like if I need a quick set of colors, I will use this this set of colors or one color. I will pick one of these. Um, in this case, I I, I didn't. Um, because I was, I think I just made everything like white at the start. Um, if, um, but if I, oh, it's already pretty clear at the start, like, oh, I want to use this variable as the color. I will just um, make a, make a rainbow. It's just more fun to look at a rainbow while you're still in early development, even though you know that eventually it'll turn into something else because it's, you know, uh, how styles of the client or what actually fits the topic that I'm looking at. Um, for example, uh, in another recent project that I did, with this one, uh, we have these colors, and they are um, so they these are about harmful pesticides, and they have like different um, different reasons of why they're toxic. So there's toxic to bees, so I made them yellow. There's environmental hazards, so um, so green. There's acute toxicity, which I made red. So I hope that these sort of if it's like yellow bees, nature green, dead red. Uh, and then the final one was more chronic health, so I made it more of a muted, um, different color that fit with the rest. So this is how I try and use the topic to help me inform my color decisions um, uh, if, if the client themselves don't have like a, a very strict color palette that I have to use. And in terms of fonts, yes, uh, for fonts, I basically just go to fonts.google.com. Uh, I wish I knew, I, I, I mean, People that are really into typography will probably have a better way of doing this. But I, 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 at the start, I kind of know, like, do I want a serif font or a sans serif or maybe monospace or handwriting? So at least I can sort of select, like, uh, this time I want, uh, I want a monospace font. Uh, and then I just type in something here, like, oh, like a word that's probably going to be used there. Uh, and then I just kind of look through it. And I select maybe a few that I like. And then I add all of those to my uh, my website and I, I um, one by one I, I turn them on and I take a screenshot and then I have like maybe 10 to 15 screenshots and I slowly start whittling down the ones that I like the least and then that's how I kind of come up with the one that I think fits this particular visualization the most. Oh. Um, on the colors uh, um, if, if there are I'll, I'll just ask questions because you know if anyone else has questions just feel free but um, while I have you here. Um, so if you were doing a project in, um, say, another language or in another culture, would you have rethought some of, like, do you take, a, do you take a, a cultural thought to the colors? Like red in, in Asian cultures means something very different in Western cultures. Like, have you, I think maybe the question is, have you worked on any projects like that where your instinct was to use like some color palette and then had to change it because of the cultural perception of those colors? Uh, no, it's not the clients that I've had for now and that where the publication, sort of the visualizations were ending up was all sort of Western based. So it was Europe and the Netherlands specifically where I live or uh, the United States. So for now, I, I haven't had to, um, to think about this sort of cultural, um, that it might be seen culturally different from what I'm used to. But it's a good thing to keep in mind. Yes, if I yeah. ever do come, come across cool. that. Um, let's see. So Irene had a, had a bunch of questions, but apparently you answered all of them. So I think that's, that's <laughs> great. So, um, uh, I'm just putting in the link to the blog post you wrote about it. Um, does anyone else have any questions for Naughty? I mean, oh, Johnny wants to know about your interest in space. And you know what, honestly, there's, there's like 30 of us. So if, if anybody wants to just unmute themselves, I think uh, you can unmute yourselves. I think that's available. Um, feel free to just 
we're all friends, so just be nice and try to keep it in order. But if you just want to unmute yourself and just ask Nadia a question, that's totally fine. John, if you want, John, if you want to do that to start us off, that'd be great. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah. Hey, hello. Hi, Nadia. How are you? Hope you're very well. Um, yeah, I was just wondering where your interest in space came from. Was it from a very young age, and who inspired you um, in the beginning? Right. Um, so in uh, how do you say that again i was i was 10 years old i had to do this again what is it again show and tell uh, at school and i went to the school library and i i randomly picked this really tiny book from the library that's called our solar system um i started reading through it and i, I somehow i i caught the bug i thought it was so fascinating to learn about how how the like the, the nature outside of Earth can be so extreme, like from extreme pressure, extreme temperature, both high and low about these, about these sort of supernovas that are brighter than an entire galaxy combined. Uh, so I, I did my show and tell, I loved it. And then I read every book about, or sort of every child's book about astronomy that was available in like the, the city library. And, and I guess it never really went, or never really went away. Even in high school, I, I figured out that math and physics and especially nuclear physics was my favorite subject. So that I was like, I have no idea what I want to become after this, but I know that I love learning more about astronomy and I'll figure something out after that. What, um, what were, uh, did you have an initial uh, goal or plan or like career trajectory in mind when you went further through school in astronomy? No, no, it's a really bad pun, but it was like a black hole. Like I didn't know what <laughs> I wanted to do after, after I graduated. Um, I totally didn't. I, I went to like two business courses from the local like railway to um, pharmaceuticals and food processing, but I eventually came across um, the, the consultancy side. It's like, oh, that's fun. You yeah. can still solve puzzles. I like that. Right, right. Um, so Isabella has a question for you. I don't know if she wants to unmute herself. And of course, if you don't want to unmute yourself, that's fine. Just let me know. But um, I, I, could, oh, there we go. I have a bit of a cough, though. Um, um, uh, my question is, like, do you ever come across data that it just doesn't seem like a compelling visualization is ever going to come out of it? Um, and if yes, like, how do you proceed? And if no, like, you know, is it like a like, is it your process that always allows um, uh, a compelling story to come out? <clears throat> so a compelling story is definitely not something that is in every data set that I have to do. For example, if I have to make a visualization for uh, a yearly report where it's just visualizing sort of the costs that they had or the sort of the, the financial streams that are happening, I can't really say that there is an interesting story hidden inside that it's just it's just a dry financial data but that um so that's not always possible but it's you can do a lot with sort of trying to make it visually um, appealing i do find it easier once i have more numbers so even if there's no story no interesting story the more numbers i have the more the easier it becomes to make it visual look visually nice just because of this sort of visual diversity that you can create by using shape and color and um, uh, other other things like subtle effects, uh, like gooey effects, or, or these sort of color blending things. Uh, so it becomes easier. But I guess what I try and do, for example, um, I did go back to Agen to create their uh, to create their yearly report, and they had one about costs, uh, and it was just a table. And I thought, well, I can make that into a uh, a tree map. It's not it's not really a tree map. In, in the sense that everything is sort of maybe one level, but it just looks nicer if it's in a if it's in a a, a square space and everything is like rectangles in a square space. Just looks nicer than a bar chart. Uh, is it easier to read? Maybe not. Uh, but that wasn't the main point, really. It's uh, also because they have like a one really giant bucket of costs, so that was easier to show in a tree. In like if you use two dimensions, but so these are I, I try and use like slightly different charts than the standard ones. If if the data is small and there's not really an interesting story to tell. Thank you. Um, cool. Um, so uh, Mirza has a question if you want to unmute yourself. Mm, yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, okay. 
Okay, just a bit. Hey, uh, thanks for a nice talk. Actually, I read the, this morning the, the blog post uh, along with the coffee, so I, it, it kind of spurred my thoughts. So, but maybe just um, if you can give us a few words on uh, the coordinate systems or obviously any, any spatial feature you want to map outside of the Earth, you need to use some mathematical projections. And uh, I read also with the, another uh, colleague of yours, like you, you tried to solve these things and you had some errors, but just maybe a few words on what you've learned and, and what, uh, like how standardized are these things and what kind of, yeah, what kind of problems you encounter in general about coordinate uh, systems in, in outer space. Thanks. Yes. So outer, outer space coordinate systems, they do have a latitude and longitude kind of thing, but it's called differently. It's called right ascension and declination. Uh, and so uh, it's also like, um, I always get them confused. Like the de declination is, is from here to like the, the North Pole or here to the South Pole. So it goes from zero to 90 or from zero to minus 90. Uh, and then there's right ascension, which goes around. So that could be from zero to 360 or which is which is basically comes from um, from ancient times from zero to twenty four hours. So that's also how we get sort of the uh, the time zones with the fifteen degrees is one hour. Um, what I learned is that right ascension people can use three hundred sixty degrees in twenty four hours. As um, like there's no really a standard on which is being used. Uh, so that was the reason why I was I have was having a, a bug for a well bug I guess a misinterpretation for a very long time because I thought I was using 360 but the data was using 24 and I wasn't really looking at the right ascension numbers that specifically to notice that the highest number was 24. Um, I was just seeing digits so I thought it's digits should be fine. So that, that, that got me confused. So then I started looking into stuff like, how could this be wrong? And I got into galactic coordinates and I thought, well, maybe I have to convert it to galactic coordinates, but there's really not such a thing because the galactic coordinates is more of a, um, in that sense, what it meant was really just how sort of this elliptical shape that you had, it, it kind of meant like, where do you point, where, do, where are you pointing to? Do you want, do you want to point where the, um, the galaxies in a straight line, or do you want to point it like rotate it in a way that the solar system is in a straight line? Um, so that was the thing that I was conf like confusing about. And I, I reached out to Phil, uh, Philip Rivier, probably saying that wrong. He's great at uh, doing any kind of geographical things. He has lots of um, uh, um, um, projections on observable and made for D3 and other stuff. Uh, he was, thankfully he helped me out. <laughs> I, I emailed him and by the end of the day, he, I, I, figured, I think he already read one or two papers on galactic coordinates and these things and he made an observable. So that was, that was pretty sweet. And, and then I had to tell him like, oh, actually I just needed to multiply everything by 15 and that solved my issue. Um, so, but he was still kind of happy that he jumped into this sort of galactic, like universal coordinates thing. And it was, uh, so <laughs> at least he, he wasn't too mad about that. That's kind of what I learned, I guess. That's funny. Um, <laughs> nice background. <laughs> <laughs> um, it was interesting when you started talking about this project. Uh, again, I'm just asking questions because, uh, you know, until others jump in. So feel free to jump in. Um, when you started talking about this project, it was interesting because it seemed like they said, we want something about Hubble and you did you, you did a lot of as you as you talked about you did a lot of data analysis and you did a lot of sketching all that is that usually what happens when you work with clients i mean it, it seems like a lot of the other projects they give you a little bit more direction than we just want something yeah yeah definitely um typically when i work with uh more uh, business clients so not newspapers or or magazines uh they have the data set pretty much prepared uh, and they, even though they might not know specifically what they want to visualize, I don't have to do a lot of data analysis because it's like, this is, this is the data. These are our numbers. Uh, and you can um, try and find something interesting in sort of in the raw data as we have it here. Uh, but more than more often than not, the client really does know what they want to show. Uh, for example, with the one of them was like, we, um, what was it again? Oh, getting things crossed in my mind. The last few things I did were all for magazines. Um, so for, for, jo like for Johnson & Johnson, they wanted to show people 
um, like look at it, the enormous amount of data that we have in our databases, you can actually access this and, and use it. So it was very much used as internal marketing. And there was just like, show us the breadth of our data, which was pretty open. Uh, but others are more than uh, like, we have these polls about election, um, uh, the upcoming the democratic presidential candidate elections at the time. Uh, can you make a visualization that shows the results of these polls? Um, so, but if it's magazines, I found that, and, and newspapers, I found that it can be very more open. It's, um, it's like we have this concept, we have this uh, idea, and we do have some data, but it definitely needs a lot of analysis before we have a story. Um, and if the subject is, uh, the problem though is that the analysis part can take, and it's like a rabbit hole. You have no idea how long that's going to take. I know even. I'm even worse at, at estimating how long I'll, I'll, I'll need to do an analysis and data preparation than I'll, how much I'll need to do make a visualization out of that. So I, I do try and always uh, work with finalized data sets with clients, but with this one, I yeah. just knew it was, that wasn't the case, but the subject was so cool that I didn't really mind having to dive into it myself. <laughs> right. Um... Yeah, so John has a question. Um, not me, John, another John. If you want to unmute yourself, there you go. Yeah. Hey, John with an H. Hey. Um, hey. Hey, so uh, thanks for this great talk. It's unbelievable. My question is, um, do you ever have um, uh, concepts or brainstorming clients or ideas that um, go beyond your technical ability or anyone's technical ability to achieve and then what happens? Um, I have a... Uh... In general, I have two kinds of these, these cases that could be, um, they are beyond my technical capability more in terms of this is more a web developer side or more backend that I can actually do. In those cases, depending on how, like how big the entire project is, I will say that I will hire someone to do, do that part for me, or I will tell them like, if you want me to do this, you will need to hire a journalist to actually write around the analysis that we're going to do, or you need to hire a backend person to write a connection between your data and the visualization that I have. Um, so that, that on the one end can happen. I guess in the other side, sometimes the projects can be so big that I know that even I cannot take them on. Um, and then I will refer these clients on to more like database agencies. Um, like these people have a team and I think what you need is, uh, is, is bigger than one person. You need people, you need, you, there's no unicorn. You need somebody who's really good at UI. You need somebody who's really good at this. You need a project manager um, to handle all of that. I guess in terms of technical stuff, I mean, yeah, if it's, if it's too much data and, uh, or if they want, something that's maybe too far into uh, 3D or 3JS, WebGL stuff. Uh, I can only still do sort of the, the basic parts of that. Um, so if it does appear that it's, again, outside of my technical scope, and it's so far out of my technical scope that I don't think that I will be able to learn it on this job, I will, again, be very honest about that. Um, but sometimes it might occur during a project, like we're already starting. And then they want something that's outside of that. And I will, again, have to be honest, like I cannot, I cannot create that for you, but maybe we can come to a compromise where we can get pretty far to that point. Although I haven't really had that very often because typically the people know less about data visualization than I do. So their thoughts are, are like smaller uh, and simpler than, than, um, than what I like, what is actually possible. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, my um, the, the domain of what I don't know is incredibly huge, and I'm very scared or, or apprehensive about you know what I don't know. It's in general there are that yes, I, I think you will always know so much less than there like you than there is to know. Um, it I guess it's. It's scary sometimes when you have an idea and you don't know if you're going to do it, but it's also interesting that if you do have an idea, like how far you can get, because you have this clear dot on the horizon, it just, it can take a considerable amount of your personal effort to learn that knowledge, uh, read through these thousands of stack overflow questions to try and sort of build up that knowledge in your mind slowly and and, 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 and like, I remember when I first started out with D3, I could be stuck on the simplest things. I could be stuck on maybe 
instead of a G element, it should be an SVG double dot G element. And if there was a difference between that, no, there wasn't, but I was still stuck on it for two hours because I didn't understand it. And it's just, again, just keep on going. And, and at some point, slowly, without you even realizing, sort of the knowledge seeps in and you, you get this understanding. Um, but it, it does help to kind of know where your current technical level is and knowing that, um, that it's fine to do one step out of, out of, outside of that, but maybe five steps outside of that, you're not re yet ready. So it's, it's good to have this sort of self-awareness of how, like outside of your comfort zone is fine, but not too far. Great answer, thank you. Great. Um, Irene, you had a question? Uh, yeah. First, thanks, Nadia, for that wonderful talk. Uh, I was just curious, what aspects of visualization projects would you consider, consider the easiest or the hardest? Because some, for, some people say, or I've heard them say, like data cleaning is the hardest part, but uh, I don't know, maybe that's different for you. Um, I think for me, the data analysis and cleaning part isn't the hardest part. It can just take a really long time to do it right. But it's not, I don't think it, because I'm not doing like these very uh, complex algorithms or predictive models or AI. Uh, the things that I'm doing is really just basically grunt work. Uh, just making sure that everything's correct and, and checking and manual checking and learn, uh, like reading things online about how the data should, uh, should look. So it's not the hardest part for me. The hardest part for me actually is really um, the stuff that happens after I have my main chart already standing. So I, the design is not necessarily the hardest part. Uh, it can be tricky, but it's also maybe because it's really fun to think about the design. I don't find it hard. It can be, I might, I might need time to actually come up with the design, but it's, it doesn't feel hard. But once I have sort of this base chart standing, like maybe I'll make a, a, a Voronoi tree map. Uh, and I have my Voronoi tree map on the screen, and then it needs to become animated, and then it needs to be able to update the data, and then it needs to resize and fit on mobile screens and fit on desktop screens. And that's where uh, I find it becomes the hardest because my skill is really on data, data science part really from my astronomy background, and the data visualization. But the more I start to have to go into web development and think about performance and think about UI and, and, and this, this resizing, that I find just hard because it's, it's JavaScript, it's all been self-taught and I've only been like, I'm always shying away from uh, any kind of new stuff. Like I'm not even using React or Vue. I've only started using Node for a year. Um, so I find just doing that code and doing it right and doing it without, without any bugs still uh, being present in the end, I find that really hard. So yeah. I see, thank you. Sure. Um, I see Mihal has his uh, hand up, so I assume that's for the Zoom hand up. I am still learning Zoom too, so um, you <laughs> yeah, you're unmuted, so go for it. Hi, Nadi, first of all. Uh, thanks so much, Nadi, and um, John also for, for sharing and, and making this happen, so it's totally amazing. I'm really still mesmerized by your contours, your contour circles. I like them so much. I have a general question. <laughs> Um, given the many technologies and tools and libraries which pop up and are advertised on a daily basis, as you mentioned some of them, how do you go about learning new stuff? Do you jump in when you see something really cool and, and say, well, I just have to learn because it's so cool, I saw an observable about it or, or I saw a tweet about it? Or do you learn things when you have a concrete task at hand and then say, well, I have a question I can solve with my technology or I, I can solve it, but not so well, and that's the time when I jump in and try to learn. Um, I think it's, I think it's a little bit of both. So for, for example, I started learning D3 after I, um, I went to a conference and I saw an introduction to D3 course. I'd never heard of it before and I saw it and when my mind was blown, I was like, I need to learn this. Um, so I started doing tutorials, but tutorials only can bring me so far. So I needed to think about actual projects. Like I want to learn D3, but I need a goal. I need, I need, I need to have a, a clear question. So I know which data I want to find. And I know that I have, like, I want to make it visual in this way. And then I need to figure out how to do it with D3. Um, so in that sense, I'm trying to look for a project to fit the tool, but sometimes it's the other way around. And I could be that I have, I have 600,000 uh, data points of satellite images that have been taken in one day and I need to make this visual and I know that D3 is not going to be able to handle that even 
HTML5 canvas isn't, so I will need to learn WebGL if I want to make this visual online. So that's that was the other way around. It's like, I have this thing that I want to do. I know what I want to do. I know that the technologies that I know right now aren't capable of doing it. Um, so I need to learn something new. And then I need to um, first figure out like what are my possible options because I had 3JS, I had uh, Regal, uh, even more stuff. Uh, and then I have to pick one and don't always pick right. I, I, gone in like with uh, tool a and then i tried it and like this is not my thing so next time i have like a similar similar thing i might use tool b that's how for example i started out with regal for uh, webgl but it didn't quite fit me i think it was too low level already for me uh, so I, next time i i used 3js and that was uh, much much better for me to use as a starter starting webgl um, so both of these things really happen uh, but i think the most important part is to always have a clear um idea or a, or a goal if you don't have one try and find one just i guess just making a bar chart even if the data is sort of very boring or just random data to me that doesn't really motivate me to actually uh, put in the time to learn the tool itself thanks cool um <clears throat> we have about five minutes left does anybody have any last questions mm -hmm. not yeah. last questions that's okay. Yeah, yeah. It's, can you hear me? Can you hear me okay? Yeah, go ahead, Maria. No, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, Nani, you were talking about um, working on personal projects, maybe for learning a new tool and stuff like that. So how do you um, find a topic to work on or maybe what makes a good topic for data visualization specifically? And how can we maybe find one for our own projects? Right. Um, in that sense, I think that having constraints really helps. So even in terms of topic, I think anything that are, you are personally interested in is the best way to go. I know that there are like these data government websites that have all kinds of information about who may, how many people live in each city and how the demographics is, is uh, ordered. But to me, that's not interesting uh, enough generally. Like I am very, I'm very niche. I like, I like Lord of the Rings. I like fantasy books. I like um, other, I like manga, these kinds of things. So if, I, if I'm really interested, I like, I like astronomy. Um, so I will try and figure out uh, a topic within that. So for, ex for example, I wanted to make a visualization about Dragon Ball Z. Uh, I didn't know what yet, but I, want I knew that that was my topic. And then I started looking online, like what data can I find about Dragon Ball Z? Uh, and then I came across a list of all of the fights, Dragon Ball Z is an anime, by the way, and a manga, uh, about all of the fights that happened during the anime. It's like, oh, that's data. I can use that. I can actually visualize that. So that's kind of how I typically, I really start out with a concept or a question, um, so a topic or a question, and within that, it's it's really insane about if you how much is possible once you have this sort of concept in mind, um, like how much you can find online about that that could be seen as data. If you are interested in movies, you can go to IMDb, and there's there's a pretty advanced search functionality about uh, information you can request about these movies. You can use that as data. Um, there is information about nature, um, you know, like what kinds of trees are there in each country. There is information about the, the books, writers. I mean, there's probably lots of information and data about Harry Potter or like I feel that even maybe even like how more specific you can be. Like I want Olympic Games or I want Hamilton or uh, and then you can start your search to try and find the data or uh, also try and help you find sort of this question like what do I want to visualize about this topic but make it something that you are personally interested in knowing and you feel that you want to actually spend time with it. Okay, great. Thank you. Great. That was great. Um, does anyone else have any last questions for Nadi? Okay. I don't think we do. So I will say, mm -hmm. um, thanks Nadi for doing this. This is great. Project sure. is great. Love it. Um, Thanks. Beautiful project. Um, and for everybody else, um, if you want, if you're interested, tomorrow we're doing another one of these chats with, I'll have to remind myself, uh, Catherine Dignazio and Lauren Klein, who have a new book out called Data Feminism. Um, should be really interesting. We'll meet at 11.30 a.m. Eastern time. Um, so thanks everybody for tuning in. Stay healthy, stay safe. Nadi, it's great to see you. Um, I hope you get to go to the store and get some more American sauce because <laughs> American sauce.
American songs. So. Thank you very much. It was very inspiring. Thanks, Thanks a lot. Great. Bye bye. Thanks, everybody. Take care. Bye, bye Nadi.